Welcome, Low Ego Action Heroes. I'm Debbie Levitt from Delta CX. You can learn more about us at customercentricity.com. And welcome to a special Friday edition. This is episode 180. I'm going to be reading you MIT's article about design thinking. It came out just a few weeks ago, if you're watching this live in February 2023. And it was interesting to see some of the increasing backlash against design thinking thinking, and especially this article because they seem to be giving a hint about how IDEO is going to change design thinking, and I'm not sure it's an upgrade. So let's uh, read the article out loud and do a little critical thinking and uh, discussing it. Please add to the chat room. But first, as always, I want to thank everybody who's giving to the channel through YouTube in small and large ways. Thanks for keeping me in streaming software and chocolate chips. Uh, certainly ate some today, though mostly I am overdoing it on tortellini. Um, I still don't have my taste and smell back from COVID, so I'm mostly going for texture and tortellini is a fun texture. So let me flip over to the article and let's press the buttons here. Hopefully that is the right button. Okay, so we've got uh, me, the chat room, the optional tip jar, and I'm sharing uh, my screen in a private browser. You can easily find this article out online. It's at the MIT Technology Review, and it's called, you can see the slug is design thinking retrospective, what went wrong. The full title is design thinking was supposed to fix the world. Where did it go wrong? And the subtitle is an approach that promised to democratize design may have done the opposite. By Rebecca Ackerman, February 9, 2023. Now it says 28 minutes to read the article, so I'm sure this is going to be a full hour show between me reading it and us uh, commenting and discussing it. So here we go. Um, also, I don't know how to pronounce anybody's names in these articles. I don't know who these people are. I'm going to get their names wrong. Please excuse me. Okay. When Kyle Cornforth were first walked into IDEO's San Francisco offices in 2011, she felt she had entered a whole new world. At the time, Cornforth was a director at the Edible Schoolyard Project, a nonprofit that uses gardening and cooking in schools to teach and to provide nutritious food. She was there to meet with IDEO.org, a new social impact spin-off of the design consulting firm, which was exploring how to reimagine school lunch, a mission that the Edible Schoolyard Project had been working on, uh, had, had been, well, should be, had been working toward since 2004. But Cornforth was new to IDEO's way of working, a six-step methodology for innovation called design thinking, which had emerged in the 1990s, but had started reaching the height of its popularity in the tech business and social impact sectors. Key to design thinking's spread was its reckless replicable aesthetic represented by the post-it note, a humble square that anyone can use in infinite ways. Not too precious, not too permanent, the ubiquitous post-it promises a fast-moving, cooperative, egalitarian process for getting things done. When Cornforth arrived at IDEO for a workshop, quote, it was post-its everywhere, prototypes everywhere, end quote, she says. Quote, what I really liked was that they offered a framework for collaboration and creation, end quote. But when she looked at the ideas themselves, Cornforth had questions. Quote, I was like, you didn't talk to anyone who works in a school, did you? They were not contextualized in the problem at all, end quote. The deep expertise in the communities of educators and administrators she worked with, Cornfo Cornforth saw, was in tension with the disruptive, startup-flavored creativity of the design thinking process at consultancies like IDEO.org. Quote, I felt like a stick in the mud to them, she recalls, and I felt they were out of touch with reality. End quote. That tension would resurface a couple of years later, in 2013, when IDEA was hired by the San Francisco Unified School District, 
SFUSD, to redesign the school cafeteria with funding from Twitter co-founder Ev Williams's Family Foundation. Ten years on, the SFUSD program has had a big impact, but that may have as much to do with the slow and integrated work inside the district as with that first push of design-focused energy from outside. Founded in the 1990s, IDEO was instrumental in evangelizing the design thinking process throughout the aughts and tens, alongside Stanford's Hasso Plattner Institute of Design, or D-School, which IDEO's founder David Kelly also co-founded. While the methodology's focus on collaboration and research can be traced back to human factors engineering, a movement popular decades earlier, design thinking took hold of the collective imagination during the Obama years, a time when American culture was riding high on the potential of a bunch of smart people in a hope-filled room to bend history's arc toward progress. Its influence stretched stretched across healthcare giants in the American heartland, government agencies in D.C., big tech companies in Silicon Valley, and beyond. Governments brought in design-thinking agencies to solve their economic woes and take on challenges ranging from transportation to housing. Institutions like MIT and Harvard and boot camps like General Assembly stood up courses and degree programs suggesting that teaching design thinking could be as lucrative as selling it to corporations and foundations. Design thinking also broadened the very idea of design, elevating the designer to a kind of spiritual medium who didn't just construct spaces, physical products, or experiences on screen, but was uniquely able to reinvent systems to better meet the desires of people within them. It gave designers permission to take on any big, naughty problem by applying their own, say it with me, empathy, Two users' pain points, the first step in that six-step innovation process filled with post-it notes. We are all creatives, design thinking promised, and we can solve any problem if we empathize hard enough. The next steps were to reframe the problem, how might we, brainstorm solutions, prototype options, test those options with end users, and finally implement. Design thinking agencies usually didn't take on this last step themselves. Consultants often delivered a set of recommendations to the organizations that hired them. At the same time, consultancies like IDEO, Frog, Smart Design, and others were also promoting the idea that anyone, including the executives paying their fees, could be a designer by just following the process. Perhaps design had become too important to leave to designers, as IDEO's then-CEO Tim Brown wrote in his 2009 book, Change by Design, How Design Thinking Transforms Organizations and Inspires Innovations. Brown even touted a selling point, his firm's utter absence of experience, oops, sorry, Brown even touted as a selling point his firm's utter absence of experience in any particular industry. Quote, we come with what we call a beginner's mind, end quote. He told the Yale School of Management, this was a savvy strategy for selling design thinking to the business world. Instead of hiring their own team of design professionals, <coughs> layoffs, companies could bring on an agency temporarily to learn the methodology themselves. This approach also felt empowering to many who spent time with it. We are all creatives, design thinking promised, and we can solve any problem if we empathize hard enough. But in recent years, for a number of reasons, the shine of design thinking has been wearing off. Critics have argued that its short-term focus on novel and naive ideas has resulted in unrealistic and ungrounded recommendations. And they have maintained that by centering designers, mainly practitioners of corporate design within agencies, it has reinforced existing inequities rather than challenging them. Years in, Innovation Theater, 
checking a series of boxes without implementing meaningful shifts, had become endemic in corporate settings, while a number of social impact initiatives highlighted in case studies struggled to get beyond pilot projects. Meanwhile, the Me Too and Black Lives Matter movements, along with the political turmoil of the Trump administration, have demonstrated that many big problems are rooted in centuries of dark history, too deeply entrenched to be obliterated with a touch of design thinking's magic wand. Today, innovation agencies and educational institutions still continue to sell design thinking to individuals, corporations, and organizations. In 2015, IDEO even created its own online school, IDEO U, with a bank of design thinking courses. But some groups, including the D School and IDEO itself, are working to reform both its principles and its methodologies. These new efforts seek a set of design tools capable of equitably serving diverse communities and solving diverse problems well into the future. It's a much more daunting and crucial task than design thinking's original remit. The Magical Promise of Design Thinking when design thinking emerged in the 90s and aughts, workplaces were made up of cubicles and closed doors, and the term user experience had only just been coined at Apple. Despite convincing research on collaboration tracing back to the 1960s, work was still mainly a solo endeavor in many industries, including design. Design thinking injected new and collaborative energy into both design and the corporate world more broadly. It suggested that work could look and feel more hopeful and be more fun, and that design could take the lead in making it that way. When author and startup advisor Jake Knapp was working at, as a designer at Microsoft in the 2000s, he visited IDEO's offices in Palo Alto for a potential project. He was struck by how inspiring the space was. Quote, everything is white and there's sunlight coming in the windows. There's an open floor plan. I had never seen work done like that. End quote. When he started at Google a few years later, he learned how to run design thinking workshops from a colleague who had worked at IDEO, and then he began running his own workshops on the approach within Google. Knapp's attraction was due in part to the radical collaboration that design thinking espoused. In what was a first for many, colleagues came together across di disciplines at the very start of a project to discuss how to solve problems. Quote, facilitating the exchange of information, ideas, and research with product engineering and design teams more fluidly is really the unlock. End quote, says Enrique Allen, co-founder of Designer Fund, which supports startups seeking to harness the unique business value of design in industries from healthcare to construction. Design thinking offered a structure for those cross-disciplinary conversations and a way to articulate design's value within them. Quote, it gave your ideas so much more weight for people who didn't have the language to understand creative work. End quote. Says Erica Eden, who worked as a designer at the innovation firm Smart Design. It makes a good story to say there's a foolproof process that will lead to results no matter who runs it. For Angela McKee Brown, who was hired by the San Francisco Unified School District to help bring the work IDEO had done on improving the school cafeteria to reality, the design thinking process was a language that bureaucracy could understand. In a district that had suffered from an overall lack of infrastructure investment since the 1970s, she watched as IDEO's recommendations ignited a new will to improvement that continues today. Quote, the biggest role that process played for us was it told a story that showed people the value of the work. End quote. McKee Brown says, quote, that allowed me to have a much easier job because people believed. End quote. The enthusiasm that surrounded design thinking did have much to offer the public sector, says Sid Harrell, San Francisco's chief digital services officer who has worked as a design leader in civic technology for over a decade.
Decades of budget cuts and a lack of civic investment have made it difficult for public servants to feel that change is possible. Quote, for a lot of those often really wonderful people who've chosen service as a career and who have had to go through times where things seem really bleak, she says, the infusion of optimism, whether it comes in the guise of some of these techniques that are a little bit shady or not, is really valuable, end quote. And it makes a good story to say there's a foolproof process that will lead to results no matter who runs it. Ideas over implementation. Execution has always been the sticky wicket for design thinking. Some versions of the codified six-step process even omit that crucial final step of implementation. Its roots in the agency world, where a firm steps in on a set timeline with an established budget and leaves before or shortly after the pilot stage, dictated that the tools of design thinking would be aimed at the start of the product development process, but not its conclusion, or even more to the point, its aftermath. When Jake Knapp was running those design thinking workshops at Google, he saw that for all the excitement and post-its they generated, the brainstorming sessions didn't usually lead to built products or really solutions of any kind. When he followed up with teams to learn which workshops I- workshop ideas had made it to production, he heard decisions happening in the old way with a few lone geniuses working separately and then selling their almost fully realized ideas to top stakeholders. Execution has always been the sticky wicket for design thinking. In the government and social impact sectors, though, design thinking's focus on ideas over implementation had bigger ramifications than a lack of efficiency. The biggest piece of the design problem in civic tech, says Harrell, is not generating new ideas, but figuring out how to implement and pay for them. What's more, success sometimes can't be evaluated until years later, so the time-constrained workshops typical of the design thinking approach may not be appropriate. Quote, there's a, mich- there's a mismatch between the short cycle evaluations in commercial design and the long cycle evaluations for policy, end quote. She says, for longtime public servants, seeing a project through, past implementation and into iteration is crucial for learning and improving how infrastructure functions. In a 2021 piece on the evolution of their practices, Brown, along with Shauna Carey and Jocelyn Wyatt of IDEO.org, cited the Diva Center's project in Lusaka, Zambia, where they worked to help teens access contraception and learn about reproductive health. Through the design thinking methodology, the team came up with the idea of creating nail salons where the teens could get guidance in a low-pressure environment. The team built three model sites, declaring the work a success. The The Diva Center's Project 1A Core 77 Service Design Award in 2016, and the case study is still posted on IDEO.org's website. But while the process focused on generating the most exciting user experience within the nail salons, it neglected to consider the world outside their walls, a complex network of public health funding and service channels that made scaling the pilot prohibitively expensive and complicated, as the IDEO.org leaders later wrote. Though IDEO intended to build 10 centers by 2017, neither IDEO nor the partner organization ever reported reaching that milestone. The article does not say how much money or time went into realizing the Diva Center's pilot before it ended, so it's not clear if the lessons learned were worth the failure. IDEO.org declined to be interviewed for this story. IDEO's 2013 work for the San Francisco Unified School District, the project that McKee Brown later worked on from the school system side, has a more complicated legacy, 
After five months, IDEO delivered 10 recommendations, including communal dining tables, vending machines with meals to grab on the go, community food partnerships for fresher produce, and an app and interactive web portal to give students and families more opportunities to participate in lunch choices. The food itself was a different issue that the district was working on with its vendors. On IDEO's website today, the story concludes with San Francisco School District's unanimous enthusiasm for the recommendations, a consultancy happy ending. Indeed, the project was met with a flurry of fawning press coverage, but with hindsight, it's clear that only after IDEO left the project did the real work begin. At San Francisco Unified School District, McKee Brown saw instances in which IDEO's recommendations did not take into account the complexities of the district's operations and the effort it could take to even drill a hole in a wall in accordance with asbestos abatement rules. The vending machines the team proposed, for instance, would need a stable internet connection, which many target locations didn't have. And the app never came to fruition, McKee Brown says, as it would have required a whole new department to continually update the software and content. An analysis a few years after IDEO's 2013 engagement showed that about the same number of kids, or even fewer, were choosing to eat school lunch despite a continuous increase in enrollment. This may have had several reasons, including that the quality of the food itself did not significantly improve. The original goal of getting more kids to eat at school would eventually be met by an entirely different effort, California's Universal School Meal Program, implemented in 2022. Nevertheless, IDEO's San Francisco School District project has had a lasting impact thanks to the work the district itself put into transforming Blue Sky ideas into real change. While few of the recommendations ended up being widely implemented in schools exactly as IDEO envisioned them, the district has been redesigning its cafeterias to make the spaces more welcoming and social for students after sometimes decades of disrepair. Today, more than 70 school cafeterias out of 114 sites in the city have been renovated. The design thinking process helps sell the value of improving school cafeterias to the decision makers. But the in-house team at San Francisco School District charted the way forward after many of IDEO's initial ideas couldn't make it past the drawing board. Empathy over expertise. The first step of design think of the design thinking process is for the designer to empathize, oops, sorry, empathize with the end user through close observation of the problem. While this step involves asking questions of the individuals and communities affected, the designer's eye frames any insights that emerge. This puts the designer's honed sense of empathy at the center of both the problem and the solution. In 2018, researcher Lily Irani, an associate professor at the University of California, San Diego, wrote a piece titled Design Thinking, Defending Silicon Valley at the Apex of Global Labor Hierarchies for the peer-reviewed journal Catalyst. She criticized the new framing of the designer as an empathetic divining rod leading to new markets or domains of life ripe for intervention, maintaining that it reinforced traditional hierarchies of labor. Irani argued that as an outgrowth of Silicon Valley business interests and culture, design thinking situated Western and often white designers at a higher level of labor, treating them as mystics who could translate the efforts and experiences of lower level workers into capitalistic opportunity. Former IDEO designer George Aie, I, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce his name has seen Irani's concerns play out firsthand, particularly in settings with entrenched systemic problems. He and his colleagues would use the language of a beginner's mindset with the clients, he says, but what he saw in practice was more an attitude, uh, more an attitude that we're going to fumble our way through and by the time we're done, we're on to the next project.
In IA's view, these consulting engagements made tourists of commercial designers who, however sincerely they wanted to help, made sure to, quote, get some good pictures standing next to typically dark-skinned people with brightly colored clothes, end quote, so they could produce evidence for the consultancy. Today, in his own studio, which works only with nonprofit organizations, IA tries to elevate what's already being created by a local community, advocate for its members to get the resources they need, and then get out of the way. If designers are not centering the people on the ground, then it's profit centered design, he says. There's no other way of putting it. McKee Brown considers one of the greatest successes of the San Francisco Cafeteria Redesign Project to be the School Food Advisory, SFA, a district-wide program in which high schoolers continually inform and direct changes to meal programs and cafeteria updates. But the group wasn't a result of IDEO's recommendations. The SFA was formed to ensure that the San Francisco School District students would continue to have a voice in the district and a chance to collaborate often on how to redesign their spaces. Nearly a decade after IDEO completed its work, the best results have been due to the expertise of the district's own team and its generations of students, not the empathy that went into the initial short-term consulting project. As she's continued to work on food and education, McKee Brown has adapted the process of design thinking to her experiences and team leadership needs. At the San Francisco School District and later at Edible Schoolyard, where she became executive director, she developed three questions she and her team should always make sure to ask. Who have you talked to? Have you tried it out before we spend all this money? And then how are you telling the story of the work? What's next for design thinking? Almost two decades after design thinking rose to prominence, the world still has no shortage of problems that that need addressing. Design leadership and design processes themselves need to evolve beyond design thinking, and that's an arena where designers may actually be uniquely skilled. Stanford's D School, which was instrumental in the growth of design thinking in the first place, is one institution pushing the conversation forward by reshaping its influential design process. Within the physical walls of the school, the design thinking aesthetic, whiteboards, cardboard furniture, post-its, is still evident on most surfaces, but the ideas stirring inside sound new. In fact, the phrase design thinking does not appear in any materials for the D school's revamped undergraduate or graduate programs, although it still shows up in electives in which any Stanford student can enroll, and a representative from D school claims the term design and design thinking are used interchangeably. Instead of empathy, make, and care, are the concepts that program leaders hope will shape the design education across all offerings. In contrast with empathy, care demands a shift in who is centered in these processes, sometimes meaning people in generations other than our own. Quote, how are we thinking about our ancestors? What is the legacy that this is going to leave? What are all the intended and unintended consequences, says academic director Carissa Carter? There are implications no matter where you work. Second, third order consequences of what we put out. This is where we are pulling in elements of equity and inclusion, not just in a single course, but how we approach the design of this curriculum, end quote. The D School's creative director, Scott Dorley, who has been with the school for over 15 years, has begun to hear the students themselves ask for fundamental shifts like these. They're entering the program saying, quote, I want to make something that not only changes things, but changes things without screwing everything else up, Dorley says. It's this really great combination of excitement and humility at the same time, end quote. The D School has also made specific changes in curriculum and tools. An ethics course that was previously required at the end of the undergraduate degree program now appears toward the beginning, and the school is providing new frameworks to help students plan for the next generation effects of their work beyond a project's completion. 
for the Design Justice Network, a collective of design practitioners and educators that emerged out of the 2014 Allied Media Conference in Detroit, Slowing down and embracing complexity are the keys to moving practices like design thinking toward justice. Quote, if we truly want to think about stakeholders, if we want to have more levels of affordances where we design things, then we can't work at the speed of industry, end quote, says Wes Taylor, an associate professor at Virginia Commonwealth University and a Design Justice Network leader. IDEO's practices have been evolving to better address that complexity. Tim Brown says that toward the beginning of the company's life, its unique power was in bringing together different design disciplines to deliver new ideas. Quote, we weren't looking particularly to help our clients build their own capabilities back then. We were simply looking to do certain kinds of design projects. End quote. He says, now, when the questions being asked of designers are deeper and more complicated, how to make Ford a more human-centered company rather than how to build a better digital dashboard, he gives us an example, IDEO leaders have recognized that, quote, it's the combination of doing design and building the capabilities of IDEO's clients and their communities to design at the same time where the real impact can happen, end quote. What this means in practice is much more time on the ground, more partnerships, and sometimes more money. Quote, it's about recognizing that the expertise is much more in the hands of the user of the system than the designer of the system, and a little, and being a little bit less arrogant about knowing everything, end quote, says Brown. IDEO has also been building new design capabilities within its own team, hiring writers and filmmakers to tell stories for their clients, which Brown has come to see as the key activity, not a key activity, for influencing change in societal systems. Quote, if you had asked me 10 to 15 years ago, he says, I never would have guessed that we would have had as many folks who come from a storytelling background within a design firm as we do today. End quote. Indeed, design thinking's greatest positive impact may have always been in the stories it's helped tell, spreading the word about the value of collaboration in business, elevating the public profile of, a design, of design as a discipline, and coaxing funding from private and public channels for expensive long-term projects. But its legacy must also account for years of letting down many of the people and places the methodology claimed it would benefit. And as long as it remains in the halls of consultancies and ivory tower institutions, its practitioners may continue to struggle to decenter the already powerful and privileged. As Taylor sees it, design thinking's core problems can be traced back to its origins in the corporate world, which inextricably intertwined the methodology with capitalistic values. He believes that a justice lens can help foster collaboration and creativity in a much broader, broader way that goes beyond our current power structures. Quote, let's try to imagine and acknowledge that capitalism is not inevitable, not necessarily a foundational principle of nature, end quote, he urges. That kind of radical innovation goes far beyond the original methodology of design thinking, but it may contain the seeds for the lasting change that the design industry and the world need now. And scene. All right. So what did we think of that? Uh, took me about a half hour, but we made it. Jamie R says the facts being laid out left, right, and center. Yeah, th there was a lot going on in there. And there were a lot of things that I still thought were being I don't, glossed over, uh, glorified. There, there were some things that sounded pretty bad that I felt like were made to sound like this isn't so bad. Um, you know, it's a very intelligent article, but you know, I think we're using some very smart words to say there's some really bad colonialism in here. There's some really bad, too many white people in here. There's some really bad fake empathy in here. Um, I, you know, in some cases, uh, design thinking sucks, says Solomon. Yeah, it sure do. Um, oh, and of course, I have my bot program to respond to people saying design thinking. So <laughs> thank you, bot. 
Yeah, when I look back at the article, um, some of the things that jump out at me were, first of all, let's talk about the future. Let's start with the unfortunate news. Oh, Jamie R. says, design thinking has had some serious long-term ramifications of the commodification of professional work, and I'd like to research the discriminatory aspects more. That's a good point, too. I also think that design thinking and how we've made, well, maybe not me personally, but how people have made it seem so easy to solve problems and have empathy and solve things in days, I think is part of the reason we have the layoffs. I've been saying this for years, Nobody cared, but if we keep teaching people that our work is easy, anybody can do it, we're all this, we're all that, then why hire us? What do you need a UX professional for? And so I think that design thinking is still going to be the enemy of good CX and UX work and serious CX and UX practitioners because it does teach everybody that you just really don't need us. We can all get in a room with sticky notes. We can make some guesses about people and boom. And that's another thing I think the article glossed over is really the need for research. One of the worst things about design thinking is how really step one isn't isn't research it's empathize for which a lot of people think that means oh i care about people i uh, i see people i see solomon i care about solomon i spoke to two people just like solomon and now i really see their world through their eyes and i can solve their problems it's definitely white savior bullshit um and i think that we have to really come to terms with if anybody the only real way to turn design thinking into something is not to rename it to design is not to rename empathy to making and caring it's about bringing all of this back closer to user-centered design because design thinking is a derivative of user-centered design in fact, we went through a whole bunch of definitions of it in episode 108. Check that out. So the only way to, to, it's funny, the only way to get design thinking right is to stop doing it and just do human-centered design, user-centered design. We have to bring back the research because the more you ignore research or skimp on research, the more you can say, sure, I understand Solomon. I know Solomon. I know people like Solomon. I know what he needs. We know what Manuel wants. We ran a survey. And I think that when you skimp on and skip research, you give yourself this pat on the back that says, yep, yep, we really know our customers because to me, design thinking is speed over quality. If we cared about the quality of stuff, we would want experts and specialists to do projects that take weeks, in some cases months, so that we know, so that we have evidence um, Anna Lucia says the whole article was pretty much saying that design thinking is not grounded, not based in reality, and it's pretty much an idealistic framework that tries to sell itself as the wonderland. Yeah, absolutely. And I have a previous article that we've read on the channel, so you can find it, and it's called Was Design Thinking Designed to Not Work? You can Google for the article, you can YouTube search for the video where I read it and we talk about it, but basically... My, one of my many points in that article is design thinking sells the fantasy that with a little bit of training or a few workshops or a pack of sticky notes, you're Manuel, you're Jamie, you're Solomon, you're Paul, you're Ana Lucia, you're me, you're Don Norman, you're Larry Marine, and you're Dr. Nick. And what I say in the article is like, look, I get it. If someone said to me that for a two-day course, you could be just like a Disney Imagineer, I'd go take that course. Now, I've got some self-awareness, so I'm not sure I would walk away imagining I really am a Disney Imagineer, but I think it would be a fun course. But if the promise was, no, really, you will be just like a Disney Imagineer. You can do their work. You can think like them. I think there's many people who, who just want that, you know, they want to hear that they can, that you don't really need me and Debbie's not so special and anybody can do that work. 
Um, Milky Drops is here. Thanks for using that word colonialism. Many times I've called out gaps or questioned assumptions and felt gaslit for it. I've been the only woman BIPOC person in many of my teams and projects. Yeah, absolutely. I think colonialism is a difficult word for people to say. I'm tripping over it now. And a difficult word for people to hear um, because it comes with so much badness. Centuries, if not millennia of badness. And... Uh, I think the average white person's response is probably what I'm thinking, which is like, well, my ancestors weren't there and they didn't do that. And the bottom line is everybody did everything to everybody. Like I, you know, nobody is, very few people are guilt-free. Obviously there are victims and oppressors here, but none of us should act like we are are guilt-free because even if we imagine our ancestors or our families didn't do this or that, We benefit today from the system that stuff created. We have the privilege, the hashtag privilege, and that makes us part of it. And we can't say we're not. I shouldn't say I'm not. It's it's ugly and it's difficult. And we have to say this out loud. We, we have to talk about decolonialization. We have to talk about the systems that keep people down solely for who they are, what they look like. Things like that. Jamie says, design thinking is like chat AI, willing to distort reality to give you what you want to hear. Love it. Ah, yeah, really interesting. Like it. Ana Lucia says that the ideas behind design thinking are nice, but it feels really incomplete. I tried to get into it. I really tried. I got bored time after time. I couldn't figure out why. Now I know. Yeah. And I think that it's really uh, those of us who like what design thinking should be about, end up loving user-centered design and human-centered design because design thinking is a derivative. I mean, IDEO didn't invent this. We already had from human factors and other things, we had human-centered design and user-centered design. We had entire departments and divisions at companies that were called research and development. These were people who were researching people, communities, technology, markets, and they were telling companies, where should you go in the future? future where where can we leap ahead of the competitors and define the future but everyone said isn't it cool that we can run a workshop in a few days and be so collaborative and everyone blah 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 and then we fired all these r&d people and then we wonder why everything's crap so we used to have all kinds of processes in place where we cared about experts and specialists we cared about research we cared about the data from research we cared about when our research was bad or wrong or incomplete or outdated and we cared about what happened after that research now everything is just theater what can we do in a few days that will guess at a solution we'll get the guess out there and we'll just see what happens it's constant rolling of the dice it's constant throwing darts at the dartboard Uh, Let's take a look at a couple of other things in the article that struck me. I'm going to just scroll back and see if I can find it and remember where those were. Um, Yeah, so it says in the article, the first step of the design thinking process is for the designer to, everybody say it with me, empathize with the end user through close observation of the problem. And what I found is in nearly all the design thinking work that I've seen or heard about, that wasn't there. Now, of course, where does that come from? We have close observation of the problem. It comes from pointing this way, user-centered design being research first and evidence-based. It comes from human factors engineering. It comes from the scientific method we all learned in school where step one was observe and research. Step two was come up with a problem or question. And step three was what hypothesis might answer or solve that problem or question. So a research first, um, paradigm has been around forever and design thinking claims that we're going to start by empathizing by uh by knowing our users or researching or observing but it's not happening design thinking could have been valuable If we had insisted on that research, but I've seen too many books, too many articles, too many trainers, too many authors, too many speakers at events saying, look, just go in there with what you know about customers. You work there, you know, your users, 
guess that they're, you, you think you know what their problems are. You're probably right. Now everybody brainstorm solutions. So design thinking should have been some sort of framework for problem finding, but they've glossed over that. They've glossed over problem finding. They've glossed over the problem statement. They've glossed over using research to go back and check your problem statement. Ooh, we had a problem statement. Then we did research. Ooh, it wasn't quite right. So if IDEO doesn't clean that up in their new version of design thinking, I think we're going to see a lot of the same backlash. Um, so let's see what else stood out to me in the article. Yeah, I, you know, I've read a bunch of design thinking articles where they talk about how design thinking workshops and IDEO's recommendations and things like that don't often take reality into account. Now that's tough. Someone might say, Hey, leave your reality at the door. Design thinking is so innovative. It's about these blue sky ideas and who knows if they can happen. Okay. But you can't give a school district a whole list of ideas of things that they can't do because nobody can drill a hole in a wall. So I think that there has to be some balance between innovation and disruption and fresh ideas and matching those eventually to a grounded reality where we look at, can any of those ideas happen? What would it take to make those ideas happen? If the vending machines required internet connections, can we find the vending machine that has the built-in internet connection? Right? I've got a little Wi-Fi thing that's like this big. We now have all this in our phones. Okay, this was 10 years ago. They didn't have that. But if you were trying to do something like this now, there are more solutions. I don't know. Maybe this is just a time thing. Anything else jump out at any of you about the, uh, the article about design thinking? Oh, yeah. It also jumped out at me the, the glossy bullshitty storytelling layer for these consultancies to act like, oh, we really changed contraception in Zambia. And I feel like, oh no, more white savior bullshit. You know, you didn't, you just didn't. I mean, you still have it up on your website as a, as a case study. That's you know, to, to me that, that starts to get into things that don't work for me. So whether that's morals or ethics, I, I, I don't have a lot of tolerance for that type of thing. Yeah. So ultimately I would say this article paired with the, um, uh, was design thinking designed to not work? And let me quickly uh, find what video episode that was. 142. So you can uh, come on over and subscribe here, uh, Delta CX on YouTube. We're uh, at about 6,500 subscribers and still shadow banned. So we really need your help and support in subscribing and sharing this with friends. But check out video 108 for what isn't design thinking and video 142 for was design thinking designed to not work. Jamie says, I attended a design thinking week back when I was in college and looking back, we achieved really nothing useful. Any useful work was the result of individuals doing plain research, not design thinking. Yeah. When I uh, was researching for my 2019 Delta CX book, uh, which I don't suggest you buy because my new book customers know you suck is way better. And if you're going to read one, please read this one. Um, when I was researching for the Delta CX book, I was trying so hard. I spent hours and hours across multiple days, Googling and Googling all kinds of different things to try to find case studies about design thinking from the corporate world. I, I was trying to find case studies about design sprints and about design thinking to try to figure out where are all of these amazing success stories? Where are all of the, the statistics about how many products went to market because of these workshops and how much money companies have made? You would think that somewhere out there, this stuff is easy to find. And at least in 2019, when I was doing that research, I couldn't find it. I couldn't find 
anything on this. You would just get these really generalized stories like, and everyone really enjoyed the five-day workshop. We really had fun in the five-day workshop. We really felt like a team. We felt camaraderie. We felt camaraderie, and we really liked our teamwork in this team workshoppy team, team, team thing. I had a real hard time finding any solid stories or case studies that said, this team did a one week design thinking set of exercises or design sprint. From that came this set of ideas and we focused in on this one. Then we spent how long? Surely not two days. Maybe you tested a quick thing in a day or two, but probably you spent weeks and months on it. I hear all the, t from all of you, you all message me privately and you tell me about how after the, the design sprint, your company spends months on an idea that's incredibly risky, wasteful, and expensive. You never catch these case studies that say, oh yeah, after we had this idea in the design sprint, we spent uh, two months on the design and then engineering spent two months and three months. And after five months, we had something we could put out to the public and here's how it did. Shweta says these systemic problems, poverty, improving lives, seem enticing to make agencies seem they're doing humanitarian work, but these are not easy problems to solve, much less via one project. Yeah, and if you don't get a freaking amazing agency who truly, truly has care and empathy and selflessness in their heart, you're going to get that bullshit white saviorism. You're going to get somebody, you're going to get a bunch of white people who come into India and say, here's what we think you need. And they're not going to take the time to learn anything that we talk about in anthropology or ethnographic studies. They're not going to really see the community in their world the way the community sees it. They're not going to solve problems based on what makes sense for the community. They're going to apply Western ideas. They're going to apply capitalistic ideas in many cases, not all, but in many. So... Yeah, we we think we want to solve all these things and then you're it it's not right. Sorry, this stuff is so delicious. <laughs> Hashtag not sponsored. Um, true lemon flavor packets. Hashtag not sponsored. That would be a great sponsor. I would love to have a few sponsors that have nothing to do with UX so that you know I'm not like bought and sold by UX tools and crap like that and VPN. Like I just wanted to say like I'm drinking true lemon water flavor packets and I love them and they sponsored me. Like that would be so much fun. That would be, then they'd send them to me. That would be great. Even if I paid for them, that'd be great. Um, so yes, not still not sponsored by anybody, mostly on purpose, because I don't want any of you to think that I am for rent. Um, though true lemon water flavor packets are delicious. <laughs> that was watermelon. Um, all right. What else? Uh, we've only got a few minutes left. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what's coming. Get in touch with decathlon. I know I'm so decathlon with my running pants. And, and, oh, the socks are from Amazon and the shoes are, are keen. Oh, where's my camera? Uh, uh. Hashtag not sponsored. Um, yeah. And then t-shirt courtesy of conferences I've spoken at. There you go. Hair courtesy of age. Um, so let's see, talk about what's coming up on the show. Uh, hopefully some exciting things. Mm, Monday, no show. Tuesday, office hours, ask me anything. Wednesday, book club. Holy cats, we are doing chapter 12. You want to be there even, excuse me, if you haven't read chapter 12, even if you don't have my book, and why don't you have my book? If you go to cxcc.to slash cKYS, you can get it <coughs> for as little as $1 uh, as a digital download. And hey, if you're liking my book, would you please leave it a review of whatever number of stars you believe is appropriate on Amazon? Because I could use a little help. I've got a couple of weird haters who are leaving me one-star reviews, probably haven't read the book. 
Uh, so next week, book club is chapter 12. And, and if you are reading the book, you know that chapter 12 is fire. Chapter 12 is common research mistakes, research, all kinds of research mistakes, overusing surveys, uh, democratizing UX. Ooh, we cover it all. Fire. So come join the book club. And again, you can find all of these in our online calendar, which is linked from deltacx.com slash links. So know ye that. Um, Paul says, did, I, did you say I can get your book for a dollar? Sure did. Um, on the deltacx.media website, you will find the uh, new book, Customers Know You Suck, as a PDF or EPUB um, for as little as a dollar. It's a name your own price. Yes, where can you get it? Deltacx.media. Shweta says, most of design literature has also originated in Western culture and rooted in Western ways of thinking. I can't think of too many authors from developing countries who have solved these problems. Yeah, that, that's another part of the bias and colonialism problem is we're not listening to those voices. Uh, we're not giving, we're not elevating those people. I mean, there's that publishing company in India and they just keep finding white Americans to write books. Uh, hello, raise up your own peeps. You know, where's all the, where's all those voices? Surely those people can certainly write about uh, elements of UX and design. Why, you know, and obviously I can point at myself a little bit here. I am white. This is still true. Um, except, you know, I'm, I'm just publishing my own book. You can all publish your own book. It's not that hard and it's kind of fun. Um, what else is going on next week on the show? Don't forget Thursday, March 2 is kind of like Darren's Chit Chat Hour. Once a month, the first Thursday of each month. So that'll be Thursday, March 2. We are live on remo.co. Not sponsored. I pay them. Just find the calendar at deltacx.com slash links or join our Slack or Discord communities, which are free, and check the live events channel. Also right now in Slack and Discord, go to the general channel. I'm running a survey and I would love to get your response on that. Larry and I are trying to figure out, should we come to your city and do a workshop? We don't know if you don't fill out the survey. So we'd like to hear from you about where you are and how far you're willing to travel to see, can we meet in the middle or do we need to come to you? So hop on over to Slack and Discord and fill out that survey. I also posted it to LinkedIn. If you're following me there, check the uh, post for that. Do I still have potato chips on my face? Was anybody going to tell me this? Um, and then next Friday we'll be practicing critical thinking, March 3rd. And, um, oh, thank you, Paul. Um, by the way, pra uh, next week's practicing critical thinking is also going to be fire. In addition to the things that you've been sending in that I'm saving, I've also been screenshotting some of the bizarre things that continue to be posted about me on Reddit by probably one person or maybe one person and their hench people. Um, but I have some really obsessed unwell haters, but I thought it would be great critical thinking to take a look at the things they're saying about me and see if any of them are true. Because because interestingly enough, some are true, but then some are not. How do we take a look at some of these accusations that people make about other people and look at them with a more critical eye? It's easy to criticize anybody. Criticize me, Larry, Dr. Nick, Darren, whoever. But when we see someone else doing this, how can we think critically about it and try to determine if this is good information? Yeah, Shweta says, sorry, Reddit has been so mean to you. You know, it's it, it's not really Reddit. It's really just one person and then a few people piled on. And then, of course, the moderators didn't care and kind of encouraged it. So I think that we should, while I'm not going to look at the original post, even though I do have a screenshot of it, um, and the original post was unfortunately extremely not true, I do have some screenshots of some of the most recent cries for attention by this hater and I think that we should take a look at them. So, um, yeah. Uh, so in general, please don't send me to Reddit. I do find it to be an ugly place. Uh, and I do think that the UX design Reddit does need actual moderation because there were some pretty ugly things about me on there that are not true. And, you know, I think some of us have to remember that, uh, 
opinions are opinions and sometimes it goes beyond that and we just have to be careful like sometimes people say to me hey deb you say negative things about jared spool all the time are you worried he's going to sue you and i say it's still legal for me to give my opinion so it's absolutely legal to give your opinion uh privately and publicly but i think it's also important to to learn to have critical thinking when you hear people saying things about people especially that sound like facts um because i've seen on this reddit this person is writing like debbie levitt is this and debbie levitt that and it's very interesting to me because these are all things that we can verify these are all verifiable things so we can know if these are true or not they're not in some cases they're not even opinions Ana Lucia says, look, I'm not saying I agree every time with everyone because I can think for myself and I have my own b beliefs, but I would never do such a thing to anyone being mean and saying lies. Yeah, ultimately, some people really, really need attention very badly. This is usually a sign of narcissism. And when they want to hurt people on the way to getting that attention for themselves, it's often, but not always, malignant narcissism. So we're going to play in right into this person's hand. We're going to give them the attention that they want. But I'm going to teach you to use critical thinking so that when you see people like this having their little tantrums, you can then look at that and say, yeah, that, se that seems true or no, this doesn't seem true or wait a minute, what else should I know here? There's got to be a missing piece. Shweta says, a consistent theme with that group is invalidating designers who come up with problems about working in UX. It's all, you need to do better, you're not doing enough. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of toxicity out there. And look, I'm not perfect. I'm not going to be here next week selling you on my perfection. I'm going to be absolutely owning up to, to imperfections. Um, However, I still want to make sure people are thinking critically when they see some of these bizarre uh, statements and accusations. I believe one of them said, Debbie Levitt has no UX experience. That's verifiable. We can learn if that's true or not. We don't have to take that person at their unfortunately uh, biased uh, and unwell word. So, so fun stuff. Um, that'll be uh, next week after we go through whatever you send in for the show. Ana Lucia says, uh, LinkedIn, what about it? Did I miss something? This is, uh, what do you mean? So anyway, don't forget, join all of our stuff, deltacx.com slash links. Don't forget to subscribe here on YouTube because I'm usually here live two, three, four times a week trying to do my best to help others and teach critical thinking. Um, so we've got lots of uh, uh, wacky shows coming up that I hope you will, they can go on LinkedIn and see your experience. Um, hypothetically, yes, and also I've worked with other humans. So you can always be like, hey, so-and-so, I hear you worked with Debbie you know, is that real? Yes. You know, like we're doing a project right now at Delta CX. I'm doing UX work. <laughs> so, you know, do I have no experience? No. Do I have a small amount of experience? No. But let's talk about it next week on the critical thinking stream because some, there's something going on in there and we should be figuring out what it is because we are all mini detectives. And we're low ego action heroes who like to play mini detective and try to figure out what are what is someone saying? Could it be true? Is it is part of it true? All of it true? You know, what can we believe here and, and what's really going on? So I'd rather teach you the skills than just go to Reddit and go, no, it's not true. I have a lot of experience. Wah! So yeah, not worth it. Not going to go fight that there. I'm going to fight that here with critical thinking. So, um, and otherwise I wasn't looking at Reddit and I didn't know about it, but somebody private messaged me and I have this little app that tells me when my name is being used on a public web page. And sometimes I go and check that. My mistake to end up back at that ridiculous Reddit topic. Hey, Malika, uh, you're late. Yes, we're closing up the show, but you can start at the beginning if you'd like. Happy Friday. Happy weekend to you. Everybody have a super weekend. Be well. Be healthy if possible. Get better if you're not. And um, let's see, Monday, no show. So I'll see you for Tuesday office hours. If you want to send something ahead of time and be one of the first questions answered, please go to deltacx.com slash links and uh, answer the survey so Larry and I know to come to a city near you. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. Um, and uh, 
I was going to say happy design thinking, but I don't really mean it. Happy user-centered design. Bye. Customer centricity as business intelligence. Visit DeltaCX.com to learn why we are...